Hello and welcome to SW TV. My name is Andreas Lenkig, a software architect here at SSW. I'm joined today by Mehmet Ozdemir. Uh, he's a solution architect with many years in the database space, all in SQL Server uh, and many others. Uh, he's also spent many years in the Power Platform. Uh, you can tell he's a real DBA because he has the DBA beard and the ponytail as well. Mehmet, how you doing? Good, thanks, Andreas, and thanks for the uh, the intro there. Yes, this took. This beard took many years to cultivate and get to this uh, fine form. So uh, what are we talking about today? Well, today we're talking about uh, how do you deal with uh, multiple accounts in the same database? If you have account, account A and account B and you don't want them to logically talk to each other, how do you separate them out? Okay, well, my, my standard answer to, for these types of questions is you know, it depends uh, because we are always doing this for clients and, you know, there are different uh, different approaches and different requirements that come from clients. You could have a greenfield product, which is brand new. You could have someone uh, wanting to convert an, an existing product from single tenancy to, I, I assume we're talking about multi-tenancy here, mm -hmm. um, to multi-tenancy. So we, we, we come at it from, from um, different points of view based on what the requirement was. But I, I can go through a few examples uh, with you. Perfect. So, one approach could be um, you could use a single database with a shared schema. So what that means is you'd have a single database. Um, everyone would be sharing, say, the same orders table or the same invoices table or the same customers table. But logically within those tables, you'd use a, a, a tenant key or a tenant ID. So I've got the slide open here. You can see here in, in this database design here for contact, we have tenant ID. ID and name. So, for example, you could have tenant ID um, one and two, um, and you'd have ID, the actual client ID would be one, but that all be logically separated by the tenant ID. Now, pros and cons, um, what this means is this is very um, quick and easy for um, someone to get started or for a project to get up and running with, especially if it's greenfields. Um, it will lower the cost of your database initially because you'd only have one database to deal with. Um, schema changes or version upgrades are very straightforward because you only have one lot of changes to make. Um, but on the flip side, you now have to be really careful in your code um, because that underlying query that gets sent to the, to the server, that filter better make it through every single time yeah. where a where tenant ID equals X lands through for every single query. So you've got to make sure that middle tier of yours is bang on, um, sending that tenant ID every single time because you don't, you never want the ability for one tenant to see another tenant starter. So mm -hmm. you've got to be on top of that. We talked about pros, so some of the cons, well, um, uh, backing up data for, for tenants is, is going to be a little bit more tricky. Exporting, importing, you've now got to be aware of the tenant ID. Um, scale up, scale out. Um, if you scale up or scale out, well, it's going to happen for everyone, not just a particular tenant. You can't necessarily have different pricing models. So that's, so that's approach one. Um, if you sort of move on, um, approach two, you could then expand that out a little bit more. You can say, well, Rather than a, a single database with a shared schema, what we could do is we could actually have separate schemas for each client. So we're still in the same logical database, but what we're going to do is separate out um, those contact tables. So um, you know, any any sort of Microsoft developer will know DBO is the go-to schema, but yeah. it doesn't have to be. So you probably know this right, Andreas. That's but, right. But every table you build is DBO schema. So it doesn't have to be. You could have tenant one and tenant two um, uh, as one of the schemas. So every time a new client, a new tenant comes on board, a new client um, buys your product, you could then provision into that one database a new schema, permissions to that schema only for the users that need to see it. And that's what schemas were designed to do. They'll give mm. you that. They'll give you excellent logical separation um, between the, the the tables within that schema. Um, and in terms of uh, the middle tier, again, um, you'll just need to make sure that when queries are being sent through, that they're prefixed with the correct schema name. I tend to think that this is probably um, 
you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other versus uh, a single schema to um, implement. But this seems a little bit cleaner to me because um, this is what schemas were designed to do. They're designed to logically separate and apply security. Um, cons, well, um, it seems like a good solution to me other than uh, when you're tearing down a database or you know, where a client leaves, um, deleting that scheme is very easy, but backing it up, maybe not so, because mm -hmm. you're not just able to say, hey, back this up. Um, it's a schema within a database. So maybe it's uh, uh, an export routine that you write, which is point in time, or maybe you say this point in time, um, backup for a database now applies to this client. I'm not sure, you know, it's something yeah. I'd need to think about um, and, getting going. That, do you have any? Yeah, and then that way you'd have to do the same thing. You'd have to like make sure that if you want to put the, that client back on, you then have to reapply migrations. It seems like a bit of a story. Yeah, you do. Uh, the other thing too, um, the other thing too here is that don't forget when you make a schema change now, um, you're going to need to apply them across all schemas. Um, now, th this could be a pro or a con because it's very easy to do um, a B testing with this with this um, setup because you could say you know I'm only going to apply the next lot of changes from schemas that start with the letter from A to K or whatever uh, and you could apply it just to those um, it could also be considered a con because you've got to apply it you know so many times across so many databases so that's yeah. approach two um, the last approach that we generally tend to work with is uh, one database per tenant now this is kind of the sort of the, the, the enterprise way that you might um, look at doing this, where every client gets its own database. Um, and you can see here in this example, we've used DBO because we've just used the default um, schema in this instance. So some simplicity but, there. Well, yeah. So it's, it's one database and everything just, the client just um, connects to that database. And in this example here, you can not only have one database per tenant, but you could also have databases that are spread across servers. So if you had a tenant that had a, a particular uh, performance requirement, they could be on a, on a dedicated server, they could be on a shared server, they could be on, you know, whatever infrastructure you decide to give them. Um, when it comes to um, standing these up, so there's probably a little bit more work in terms of standing one of these up because now you need to create the database, you need to create the schemas and you need to assign all the security objects. Mm. Whereas the previous two, especially the first one, it's already done for you. The second one, you're just creating the schema and the object. So this one's a little bit more work up front to make it all work, but it gives you a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of how you want to provision these. A good example for this would be um, Dynamics has been around forever and, and this is the model that they use. Um, and it's a, it's a model that a lot of the, the, the bigger products will use. It does sound like this is certainly like an enterprise level where you're paying more, but you're getting a bunch more configuration. You're able to scale individual tenants up, individual databases up uh, based on need. Um, but you do yeah, have that, for sure. that cost. For yeah. sure. So it, 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 with this model, you know that uh, uh, a tenant or, or a client is going to get their own database. It can either be on one, one um, it can be shared within a, a VM, it could be shared within um, an Azure uh, SQL database, it could be in its own infrastructure, like it gives you complete flexibility around what you want to do. Uh, so it's you know, it's probably the sort of the, the go-to enterprise solution mm. um, and you're not messing around with um, uh, tenant IDs or, or schemas as well. So I have a problem that I wanted to pitch at you. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned yep. how do you back up and, and do things like this? How do you bring down and bring back up a, a database. So if I have uh, a friend of mine who's Bob, uh, he's a senior architect, uh, he has implemented a multi-tenant system for his application, um, but now he's noticing some of his clients are dropping off, there's less activity, almost zero, and he wants to decommission some databases um, on these tenant, these clients that are no longer really active, um, but he wants to be mm -hmm. able to bring them back online. Um, and how would he go about taking into account this, this automatic uh, decommissioning of databases. Well, in in this instance here, where, where we have a database per tenant, um, it's actually going to be quite easy and straightforward to um, to get up and running. I mean, obviously, it's going to require some some work to get it working. But 
you'd you'd have uh, a process that runs that that works out inactivity. So for whatever you've defined as inactivity, it might be a week, a month, six months, a year. So that's going to be your trigger to say, okay, this is now a candidate to be archived. Um, so at that point, once you know that trigger, then you'll implement the code to say, okay, this database is no longer current. It's it's going to be archived. So the sort of like the pseudo code would be, okay, grab database, take a backup of it, um, take that backup and potentially put it into um, some storage. Now, the nice thing about taking the backup is they can be compressed on the fly. So you have a nice small backup file, put it on storage. You can then um, drop that database. So it's now out of the system. It's not consuming any, any resources. It's not um, doing anything that it should be doing. And then in your in your application itself, um, it's then you know marked as as inactive. Now, client comes along three months later and says, "Well, you know, we didn't mean to do that. Um, it, it was inactive because we we're all on holidays and we decided not to use it for you know whatever period of time it was." Reversing that is pretty. It's just the the opposite of what we did the first time around when we deactivated it. We take the file out of um, our file store. We'd restore the backup. Once that backup's restored, it's back into the database. Then the application itself would just re reattach itself to the database and away you go. Now, one thing that I would take into account at that stage is you've had some time elapse um, during that time. So this database may have been on, say, version 1.05 and your schema itself may have rolled through to 1.09. But that's pretty easy just to apply a, a change script on top and away you go. Alternatively, if if it's marked as not being a sort of a breaking change to the actual code base itself, you may decide to keep the database on 1.05 and give the customer the opportunity to upgrade to the to the latest schema uh, you know when they're ready. So it just depends on whether the, the, the changes to the database have been sort of you know breaking changes that, that absolutely must be applied. Does that explain it? It does. I mean, do you have a project or something that you worked on where you sorted this out for yourself? Uh, a good example was um, TimePro. So in, in TimePro, we used this exact model. So what we did was we, we had a situation where we had a lot of ten databases around. Well, when I say a lot, there are a lot of people will, 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 fire up a, um, will fire up a demo or a sample one and it just sort of lies around for, for no reason. Now, they, they consume resources. Um, they're, ba they're backed up unnecessarily. So what we do for those guys is on the on the trigger, I think it may, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it was six months. Uh, when when a, when nothing has been written for six months, we we let the client know that this is happening. There is a grace period. And then once that grace period expires, the database is backed up. It's put into the file, uh, file store. The database is torn down or deleted and then the account inside the system is marked as inactive. The client can come in at any time and choose to reactivate the uh, um, their tenant and it, it will the, the reverse will apply where the, the backup will be restored, scripts will run, and then they're up and running again. So really nice solution. Well, perfect. I have to say thank you for coming on, Mehmet. You've given us a lot of information to think about. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, fine. Uh, anytime. So, yeah, if you need any uh, any any beard tips, just let me know, um, and I'll hook you up. Fantastic. So today we learnt about uh, three different methods of implementing multi-tenancy in your solution. Uh, you can have it as one database. You can have it as one database with multiple schemas, or you can have it in many different databases, each with their own schema, um, and that can simplify your solutions. Thanks very much for coming on. I've been Andreas Linkic, signing off for SSW.